welcome to the podcast series, Startup to Scale, Founders Marketing Playbook. Our podcast aims at helping startup owners, tech entrepreneurs, and marketing professionals get some practical insights. We help you understand the ground level realities of marketing challenges faced by startup owners and how a startup should approach marketing while operating on small budgets. This podcast series is brought to you by marketeers.com where our mission is to connect skilled remote marketing talent with businesses globally. We are very excited as this is the first podcast series and we have a very special guest with us today, Jocelyn Kaur. Jocelyn is a marketing expert and an entrepreneur. She drove the marketing and PR for renowned brands like United Colors of Benetton, Hugo Boss, Mothercare, Hemelies, and Canon. Jocelyn is the founder of ACWI, Associate of Corporate Women in India. She's been a speaker at the Digital Marketing World Forum Asia and the winner of Top 100 Brand Custodians India. There is a lot more to her accomplishments. The list can go on. But without further delay, let's take a plunge into the hard facts and realities of Jocelyn's journey as a marketeer, as a branding expert, and a startup founder of the company India World Global. Keep a track on your marketing, um, you know, how your marketing strategies are impacting the business. It's important to track the key performance indicators. So so what are the uh, key KPIs that a business should uh, track while, con- while, you know, strategizing? Where should I put in my monies or efforts in terms of marketing? Yeah. Um, see, there is absolutely no replacement or no proxy for sales. There's no proxy for conversions. Uh, ultimately, if you feel whatever effort you're putting in is not resulting into dollars coming in, uh, it's it's a flawed strategy. But having said that, having said that, I there are certain parameters, and again, I feel a lot depends on the category and the product that you're in. But generally, I'm going to tell you a few um, of these uh, parameters. Uh, there's always a funnel. That you there's top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and a lower funnel. Uh, Categories and products need to identify that, which is the funnel uh, that I have to put my money into. Or rather, let me put it that way, what's the contribution of the three funnels going to be in my strategy? See, no brand can operate at a level where they say, Ki, I will not spend on top five. I will not spend on the bottom. Eventually, every brand has to spend on all the three. It just depends which is the dominant one and which is probably the least for you. If you are a brand that has very high awareness, you would say, you know what, my top of the funnel is still sorted. I'm a 60-year-old brand. Let me focus on conversions. So then ultimately, your KPI really becomes conversions. You might be a brand that's uh, uh, been a dead brand for a while, for example, and you know you want to revive. You might want to keep your middle funnel heavy because you are at a point where people do know about you but are not very convinced. So you are at a stage where you know you really want to influence them, not just gain reach. Third can be a startup where you're like, okay, nobody knows about my brand. I have to invest in reach. I have to get more people to see me, to look at me. So see, that's where the basic categorization comes in. Uh, there are other factors like ROAS, which is basically what is the return on investment that you're getting. See, ultimately when you're advertising and particularly talking about performance marketing, when you're advertising, you have to keep a track of what ever I'm churning in, what is the output that I, that is getting churned out? In the end, I would like to say that there are certain mediums that do not give you anything amongst what we've discussed. They give you things like digital PR. You know, they would uh, get you a mention on a pretty interesting news portal. Yeah, how do you really identify and put a matrix to that? There are there are there are matrices which uh, will also tell you the gains that you have extracted out of it, something like an AVE, which is an advertisement equivalent. So all in all, my suggestion here is that, again, um, if somebody is trying to give you one thumbnail or one formula, there can't be, it doesn't exist. A, you have to equip yourself to understanding what category do you belong to, yeah? What is the what is the life cycle that your product is in? Where is your brand standing, right? Once you have that, then you have to educate yourself on all of these matrices because at one point in time, you would be required to keep a balance between the three or four matrices that we've spoken about. The third point that I will mention is 
go back again to the consumer persona. And see, that is the key because in the end, you are selling to a customer. Everything that you're doing, all this mesh web and spider web that we have around us is for us to reach that right consumer. If you know your consumer is at a particular point, uh, you have to understand what is the matrix that works at that point for you to uh, tell if you're yielding results or not. You know, uh, somebody can say that, you know, my customer lies at the uh, end of filling a lead form. Then you're going to look at CPL, which is cost per lead. Somebody would say that, you know, uh, I want to click. My product is so strong that I know if somebody clicks my product, they will definitely buy it. I'm very confident. Then your matrix becomes CPC. It's cost per click. So, yes, education is very important. There's no one rule, no, no one thumb rule. But yes, all of these matrices are the top and the leading matrices in the industry that we use to do a litmus test of where the brand is, where the spendings are, and if we are in the right direction or not. Absolutely. Uh it's uh, it's a good learning to hear that because there is no thumb rule for for you know all the companies you know one rule goes for all obviously you need to see where your customer is and how you're acquiring that customer and where your brand story and the and the journey of the company is and that's where you decide the right kpis to be tracked and that also keeps changing as you keep evolving and progressing further absolutely so um so building a community around your brand is vital uh, so how should um, startups approach community building uh, and how can they impact uh, in the early stages of a startup if they directly, you know, uh, also emphasize on community building along with the other areas uh, when they're starting out? Um, interesting question. So, so I, again, would like to dissect the word community because um, sometimes I feel a community is synonymous to social media. But it's not. See, a community basically means it's like-minded people coming together. Yeah. And uh, how is it that a brand will find a space? A brand will basically find a space here when you personify a brand. You know, if I have to personify a brand like uh, Nike, you know, then it is that person who will encourage others, you know, who will lift athletes up, who will not let you get demotivated. So that's my Nike's brand personality. So A, define a brand personality for your brand if you haven't done so far, right? That's very, very important because that answers a lot of doubts and a lot of questions that marketers or startup owners have relating to um, the campaigns and the tone of words as well. That's the first thing. Now, you know, when you have done this, when you have carved out a personality for your brand, you have almost won the battle hard. Because you know then who are the people who are going to be attracted towards this brand. Now, when you have understood who are the people who are going to be attracted towards these brands, then you do a simple um, uh, experimentation of where can you find these people. What do these people do in general? And then all of this is called auxiliary research around your customer. So you're not doing a research that's related to my brand and how will you consume my brand and when will you buy my brand? What is the price price point that you will my, buy my brand at, as, at, at which? Uh, what I'm going to basically do is leave my brand aside. I just want to know about you. Uh, what are your travel uh, uh, hobbies like? Uh, you know, what do you read? Uh, how do you spend time with family? So those kind of things. And then you translate into the community in offline and online space. See, if you really are serious about building a community, and if you look at the most of successful community case studies in the world, they have not been built at a single place. They have, they've had an integrated approach, you know, they have been built online and they have been built offline as well. So um, online is simple, it's social media, you know, it's Facebook groups, it's, uh, uh, certain websites that attract the similar kind of traffic or have a similar kind of content that you do. And offline, there can be many ways of doing it. For example, you sponsor like-minded events or you sponsor the events with same ideologies or you host events for your customers. You know, uh, you have certain days where, for example, if you're running a store, you basically get people in your store. So um, Community basically has to be built on similar ideologies. That is very important. And I'll tell you the second thing that's very important when you're building a community. A community needs to have a purpose. See, it's almost like the WhatsApp groups in our phone. There might be 
hundreds of WhatsApp groups, but there are only 10% of the WhatsApp groups where you're active. The rest of the 90% just exist. For, for you to make the other person active in a community, there needs to be a purpose of why that community is existing. It's not just because, oh, I have a brand and I have because I have to do community marketing as well. I've created it. For that, keep a calendar in place. What are the events that you're going to do? What is it? What is the larger structure of that community going to look like? And what is the benefit that anybody is going to drive from coming to that community? Like, I will not name this brand uh, because I uh, I consulted them over something. Now, uh, when they were building a community, they were very clear that we also want to pass on a lot of benefits to our customers. And they were very serious about it. Now, what they had done was if there was any big event happening in the city, they would ensure they pick up a few passes. And they would keep those passes reserved for their community members. So, you know, those are the kind of gratifications that you give to your customer to keep the community alive. And it's a fact. Everybody is attention deficit. Nobody has time to, um, uh, A, uh, you know, engage in uh, conversations that don't mean anything to them or conversations that are not getting any better. So, yes, you have to keep it purposeful you have to keep it beneficial to them and you have to ensure that it matches with the existence of them. yeah so uh, indeed um just lean community is not like just a, another checkbox on the list for a startup founder that i have to do this but he, the startup founders have to be very clear in their head why the purpose and when eventually people are there in the community how will they be engaged and how will they be benefiting from that community yeah, yeah. Um, so um, tell me, uh, just tell us, uh, Jocelyn, when we are scaling up a startup, it also involves entering new markets, targeting new customers, uh, different demographics. How would you pivot your marketing efforts and uh, marketing strategies to expand to different geographies, regions or different customer base? This is a very complex question, Riddhi. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'd, I'd try my level best to answer this in uh, in whatever little time frame we have. So um, it does start from the fact that there is something which is core, which is a foundation, which doesn't change. Yeah. And then there is everything else, which is a cultural nuance. Uh, then there is a cultural nuance is also known as psychographic within the industry. And then there is something called demographic. Now see every country uh, operates in a very different economic zone. If you look at the population of Japan versus the population of India, a very basic difference, you know, which any layman marketer would know, is the age difference. You know, Japan doesn't have a lot of young population. India has a lot of young population. Now, there is, if there is a brand that is currently dominant in Japanese market and they are wanting to come to India, for example, uh, one basic demographic change that they'll is they'll have to change their tone of voice to suit to a little bit of a younger audience. You know, the the youth appeal have to will have to be there. Uh, the psychographics uh, is a, is a more complex umbrella. See, uh, uh, I will tell you a research that I had uh, seen a, a couple of months back, which was around Amazon. And uh, in India, Amazon is not used so much for high end shops. Yeah, uh, you know, perhaps you want to buy some hardware or you want to buy, a, a, you know, a product where brand probably doesn't matter much. And, you know, it's the convenience that you'd, you'd, you'd order it from Amazon. But that's not the case in U.S. Uh, in U.S., there are people who are also buying uh, fashion earrings on Amazon. And, you know, they're also buying uh, very high electronics on Amazon. So this is the cycle. What you think about Amazon here in India and what you Americans think about Amazon there in US is different. Now come, let's come to the core of a brand. The core of the brand is that I am in the market of lifestyle. That never changes. Why? Because your product line, your legacy, your history, everything is built on it. So see, these are this is like a sandwich model. You have to dissect each and every part and see that when I'm moving from one country to another country, what is changing? Apart from this, you know, there are certain uh, cultural nuances, like uh, certain practices that can be offensive in a particular country. Uh, 
or certain practices that are mandatory in a certain country yeah uh, i do remember that uh, we were opening the store in myanmar when i was at uh, when i went to store uh, i was working at benetton and when we had to open the store uh, there was a certain kind of ritual that uh, um the myanmar team wanted to do and and i very politely recommended them that can we do this ritual one day prior they said no so if the store has to be opened at 3 o'clock the ritual has to be done from 2:30 to 3 like you know that was that was a sentiment that you had to manage because uh it was almost like even if the media is at the door they said it's pretty cool like everybody knows everybody understands that this ritual would have to be done in this way at this certain time so it's it's a mix of a lot of things and again you know what i would say is and for any marketer see the basic thing a marketer has to keep on doing is researching researching about their consumers researching about consumer habits markets and educating that's very important you know because if you are not catching up with your consumer and what the consumer is doing and how the consumer is, is evolving there would come a point where you will start having a disconnect with the consumer because your consumer is not the same So today, if a thirty-five-year-old is buying my brand, it's not that always it will be the thirty-five-year-old who will buy my brand. Maybe the thirty-five-year-old has now become forty-year-old, and he's still my buying my brand. Or maybe I have recruited some new consumers who are very similar to the thirty-five-year-old in the mindset, but their real age is twenty years. So as you see, there is there is a lot of complexity to be dealt with here. uh but yes the three sandwich model that i mentioned to you has to be always used when you're either moving geographies or you're moving cities or you're moving continents uh for your brand so again uh, not to miss because this word is very important which is globalization and globalization means this that you know the core and uh, the foundation of your brand stays where it is and then because that's global yeah so globally you have a certain image and you are true to that image you will never compromise on that a starbucks has a promise that i'm going to use 100% arabica beans and you know there's going to be an ambiance that i will give to my uh visitors i will never ask you to leave even after you you done with your coffee it will be a melting pot of uh, conversations they're true to that but they do or they do have a paneer tikka sandwich here in india which they don't have in milan for example so that's really what we mean by globalization thank you so much jasleen for say, uh, sharing so much uh, in depth um, you know points and the details intricacies with us because uh, definitely you know dealing just um, uh, you know expanding in one geography forget about many you know it takes a lot of thorough research as to why are you going there who are you going to be targeting and and it what in what language in what product tone will you probably target and make the customer happy uh, thank you for sharing that so um Uh, all in all you know lastly for the aspiring entrepreneurs listening what is your advice of of creating a sustainable and impactful uh, marketing strategy um, you know for the early stages of of the startups um riti so first i think i will begin with saying that uh, entrepreneurial journey uh, is a very difficult journey it's a very lonely journey you know uh, there is a beautiful painted picture of entrepreneurship on our social media one of the unicorn founders was at khan festival so everything looks very glamorous and a glitzy while it's not you know there are certain times when you are not even able to navigate your day because you are literally running the entire show every department every deal uh, every pitch um i am not sure if the uh, entrepreneurs or startup owners in the beginning also have that much appetite time and investment for marketing they do that's a practical uh, fact what you can do at that time is you can stay true to the purpose and ideology that you have that's very important see because in the end everything that you are doing today will get translated into your marketing campaign will get translated into your marketing story right you can't be a you can't be a brand that is say for example creating products for women and you're not treating women right in your organization yeah just a simple example yeah so uh, think about marketing as a playbook that you're using in your organization to treat people to treat your customers to um 
to treat your uh, product in that way. So that's very important. And the second thing is uh, marketing doesn't always have to be paid. Marketing doesn't always have to be um, uh, uh, like a cost center. If you have even one great person in your team who's amazing with social media, you can carve out your own marketing strategy around me marketing, for example, around uh, uh, just Instagram reels, for example. The idea, the bottom line of marketing is that you have to get in touch with that customer. Yeah. And there can be some very creative ways of doing that. So that would be my second uh, suggestion that, you know, whatever resources you have within your setup, try to see where is it that you can create a part with the customer. It can be as simple as maybe you have a brilliant store. Yeah. So then make this your top marketing strategy that I'm going to invite customers to my store every month. You know, if you're running a restaurant, think of it like I'm going to serve 20 free coffees um, <clears throat> every month. Yeah. Uh, so I think you also have to be frugal and creative in that sense. So yes, those two are going to be my top strategies. And see, third strategy is not required. If you have money, then there are hundreds of things that you can do. But when you don't have money, these are the two things uh, and the top two things that you should be doing. Yeah. So um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jasleen, for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule. It was really inspiring and insightful to hear your journey and to hear the perspectives and take a deeper dive at each topic that we touched. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks a lot, Riddhi. It was a pleasure for me to be here and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, we'll uh, keep getting more and more startup founders and keep discussing and discovering more about how can we approach marketing and what it means to every brand. Can we be to b Can we be to b 2 How you can approach marketing and while still keeping your costs low. Thank you so much for listening.